the first uh, 10 plus years as a heart surgeon, I was increasingly unhealthy. I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was destined for my own operating table. Weight loss really becomes a side effect of improving your metabolic health. My mission is to get this information to as many people as possible and to help them to take back control of their health. Phil, your core health message is that all of us need to take our metabolic health serious and to fix it when needed, which is most of us. Let's start out by defining what metabolic health is and why it matters. Sure thing, Jesse. And, you know, metabolic health is really uh, an important concept because it is at the root cause of most of the chronic disease that we face in society today. And unfortunately, it's not well understood by many healthcare practitioners, by the healthcare system itself. And therefore, you know, it's not well understood by the general public. So, when I talk about metabolic health, the simple concept is when we are metabolically healthy, our bodies are properly utilizing the inputs that we are giving it. And the primary input that we give our bodies is the food that we eat. When we eat, one of three things is supposed to happen with that food. Some of it gets turned into immediate energy to use to fuel all of the activities that are, you know, going on in our bodies on the cellular level, on the macro level. Some of that food gets broken down into its components and it's used to build, rebuild the tissues, another process that's always going on in our bodies. And then some of it gets stored as energy because, you know, historically, ancestrally, there would be plenty of times when food isn't available. And even today, you know, food is always available, but we're not constantly eating. Some of us are, and that's a whole nother problem that we'll talk about. But for the most part, we don't eat on a continual basis. So we need a mechanism by which we can store energy and then use it later on when energy isn't available. Now, our modern food environment has broken that system. It basically has set up a situation where we end up storing too much energy and we never get a chance to use that stored energy. And that's what metabolic disease is. That's when our metabolic health breaks. And that really is at the core of most of the chronic diseases that we face today. Well, I think it's really important we hash all that out at the beginning because metabolic health is a term in the health and wellness space that gets thrown around a lot. But in its simplest form, the way you just broke it down, it makes a lot of sense. And it makes it really easy for us as the end users what we need to do because this is what is at the core of our chronic health problems. You talked about the biggest input being diet. So basically to zoom back, giving us control in this whole situation, we just need to control what we eat and when we eat to have the biggest impact on this, this whole mechanism. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that's a real core part of the messaging that I try to impart to people is that you do have control of this. This is not something that someone else is going to do for you. You know, your physician isn't going to do it for you. The government isn't going to do it for you. Your health insurance company, whatever it might be, uh, this is under your control. And while we many of us have fallen prey uh, to the forces that are working against our metabolic health because quite honestly this whole system can be manipulated against us uh, the good news is ultimately each one of us as individuals is in control of what we choose to eat how we choose to live and we each have the power to improve and optimize our metabolic health and we're going to get into the nuances for people, how they can get in there and do the work and take their health back. But before we do, I think it's important people have an understanding of where their current metabolic health is. And you talk about in your book, the simplest way to do that is to look at our waistline. So let's talk about what, and, and obviously that sounds really simplistic, but let's get into the nuances. It's not just measuring, you know, your pant size. How does somebody go about doing that? And then what is a healthy range? that we want to fall in. 
Definitely. And waist circumference is one of the five basic metrics uh, that we use to assess metabolic health. And just to frame the conversation for people to understand, when you look at those five basic measures that we'll go through, 88% of the adults in the United States are not in optimal metabolic health. Only 12% of us at the time of you know the most recent data, it might be even worse by now, uh, but uh, only 12% of us can meet all five measures of optimal metabolic health. And waist circumference is the one I start with because you can do it yourself. You can check it at home. You don't need anything special. All you need is a tape measure. And you take that tape measure, you measure just above the level of your belly button. You do that first thing in the morning. And if you are a man, your goal is for that to be less than 40 inches. If you are a woman, it should be less than 35 inches. So very simple metric, very powerful predictor of whether or not you are metabolically healthy. Let's talk about the other four and just lay the groundwork here. Sure. So the second one, again, you can check this at home. It's your blood pressure. You can get a home blood pressure cuff pretty inexpensively. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you know, almost every supermarket uh, pharmacy these days has a kiosk that you can get your blood pressure checked at. Or just about every time you go and visit a physician, you're going to get your blood pressure checked. And the goal is for your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 85. Both of those numbers need to be under the cutoffs, and that needs to be without the use of medications. If you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, if you've been started on medication to lower your blood pressure, that is an indicator that you are not in optimal metabolic health. The other three metrics are all going to come from some basic blood work. And again, this is blood work that most physicians are going to check, you know, as part of your annual checkup. You, there are many ways here in the United States, especially, to order your own blood work. So it's simple enough to get these things checked. Uh, and they're key indicators. I believe everyone does need to know these numbers and should be assessing them on a repeated basis. So we're going to look at your fasting blood glucose level. The amount of sugar that's in your bloodstream when you haven't eaten for about 8 to 12 hours the goal is for that to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is the units we use here in the United States. Again, that needs to be without the use of medication. So if you've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, if you've been started on medication to lower your blood sugar, another indicator that you are not metabolically healthy. And then we're going to look at the cholesterol panel. And again, you know, you go to your doctor and it seems like all they talk to you about is your cholesterol. But the interesting thing is that they are usually referring to one number on that cholesterol panel, the LDL cholesterol, what we have been told is bad cholesterol. It turns out that that number, LDL cholesterol, has nothing to do with your metabolic health. Two other numbers on that panel do have to do with your metabolic health your HDL cholesterol. This is the one that we nickname good cholesterol. And we nickname it that because the higher this is, the better. That's confusing to a lot of people because all they've heard their entire life is you need to lower your cholesterol level. But HDL cholesterol, you actually want more of that. Specifically, if you're female, your level should be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. If you're male, it should be over 40 milligrams per deciliter. And finally, we look at the triglycerides, which is another number on that lipid panel. It's another type of fat-carrying particle or cholesterol-carrying particle that's in our bloodstream. And we want our triglycerides to be lower. Specifically, we want it to be under 150 milligrams per deciliter. So you look at those five basic measures. Um, if three of those three or more of those are not in that healthy range, that diagnoses you with the metabolic syndrome. It's a medical diagnosis. And what it means is that you're at very high risk of developing chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, like heart disease, like Alzheimer's disease, like many forms of cancer that have been associated with the metabolic syndrome. If one or two of them are abnormal, that's a warning sign. 
because we know that people that have one or two abnormal today are likely to progress and end up with the full metabolic syndrome. Like I said, only 12% of us have all five of those within the normal range, but that needs to be your goal because that is what's going to help you to avoid all of those chronic diseases that we mentioned. If you haven't done so already, please take a quick second and subscribe below. This is going to help the community continue to grow and help the show continue to bring on the biggest guests. Thank you ahead of time. Continue to enjoy this episode with Phil. Before we move forward, I want to come back to the LDL piece. And you're somebody who is, you know, in good position to give us advice on this being a heart surgeon. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of people that are worrying about that bad cholesterol and taking that too far. It's not to say there's no merit there whatsoever, but it's not the whole story. Right. So let's get into the physiology of LDL and why classically doctors believe that is the culprit when it comes to heart disease, atherosclerosis, and challenges like that. Yeah, so we really need to go back a, a little bit in history to kind of reconstruct the story here about how we were led to believe that LDL cholesterol was the end-all and be-all when it comes to heart disease. Um, you know, early 1900s here in the United States, heart disease is essentially undescribed. It's a rare disease. Leading physicians of the time would go their entire careers without seeing cases of, of atherosclerotic heart disease, plaque buildup in the arteries that ultimately leads to reduced blood flow in the arteries on the heart. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things that leads to heart attacks. So fast forward, early 1900s, heart disease incidence starts to rise. We get to 1950s, and now we have what's considered to be an epidemic of heart disease. Dramatic increases in the incidence of heart disease. The president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, has a heart attack while in office, 1955, and this appropriately sets off the alarm bells. And the leading scientists of the time had two competing theories about what the primary driver of this increased heart disease was. One theory was that it was dietary cholesterol and saturated fat in the diet that was leading to a buildup of cholesterol in the bloodstream, which then became a buildup of cholesterol-based plaques in the arteries of the heart. The other theory of the time was that sugar in the diet was uh, causing heart disease. The way that that works is that high levels of sugar in the bloodstream is damaging to the blood vessel walls, causes damage to the lining of the blood vessel walls, and that was thought to be a contributor to heart disease. For various reasons, uh, most of them not scientific, the cholesterol theory won out. What was called the diet heart hypothesis became the prevailing theory about what was causing heart disease. And this then led us down a couple of pathways. One pathway was ultimately led to the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. 1980, uh, the first version of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines was released. And the basic premise of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines is that we need to minimize fat in the diet in general, saturated fat and cholesterol in particular, and that was going to help us with the problem of heart disease. The other thing that came out of this theory was development of medications to lower cholesterol levels. Statin medications became the most widely prescribed class of medications uh, starting in about the 1990s. So here we are 30, 40 years later, we've been under this prevailing theory that cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, dietary saturated fat is the primary driver of heart disease. We've lowered our consumption of saturated fat and cholesterol. We've increasingly used medications to lower our LDL cholesterol levels. And despite that, heart disease remains the number one killer in the United States. And in fact, the incidence of heart disease um, has worsened over the past 10 years. And when you zoom back out, uh, you know, we had a small decrease from about 1985 to about 2000, and then the rate has started to go up again. 
And most of that decrease in retrospect is probably attributed to decrease in smoking rates. We now know smoking is a major contributor to the development of heart disease as well as these dietary factors. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the cholesterol hypothesis, the diet heart, heart hypothesis is not leaning to a meaningful reduction in the incidence of heart disease. And that's why I believe we need to step back and question whether it was the right hypothesis in the first place. And when I say that it may not be the right hypothesis, cholesterol clearly plays a role in the development of heart disease. When you look at these plaques, you do see cholesterol there. Um, it's just not clear that cholesterol is driving the process. In fact, you know, and the alternative theory, going back to the sugar theory, is that the blood vessel wall gets damaged by something, sugar being one of those things that can damage the blood vessel. Cholesterol is a repair mechanism that the body uses, and certain types of cholesterol particles are particularly uh, prone to forming these plaques and to then building up and ultimately causing blockages. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance there. There's a lot to unpack. Most doctors don't understand this well, but we've gotten to a point today where basically the theory is, the thought is, that if you just keep your cholesterol level low, you're going to avoid heart disease. And the unfortunate that, uh, thing that I see as a heart surgeon is lots of people with low cholesterol levels end up on my operating table. So what I'm hearing you say, the likely cause well, not likely cause, the cause of the damage is things like smoking and sugar. And then the cholesterol is likely there as a band-aid or a scab. And because of association, not causation, it's been given the blame for what's causing the problems further down. Exactly. And, you know, the analogy that I use uh, to explain this to people is, you know, if you punch a hole in, the, in your wall, and then you get the spackle out and you, you know, patch that hole. If you keep punching holes in your wall and you keep putting more and more spackle, eventually that spackle is now like sticking out of the wall. And that's basically what's happening. And you can say, okay, well, if I just don't have any spackle around, I'm not going to end up with, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the spackle sticking out of my wall. But most of us in that situation would say, stop punching holes in your walls. And that's what we really need to look at. We need to look at the factors that are causing damage to the blood vessels in the first place and reverse those factors. And that's where we circle back to metabolic health, insulin resistance. Insulin resistance creates the environment that allows our blood vessel walls to get damaged. And if we address the insulin resistance, that is how we can have a more effective uh, prevention strategy when it comes to heart disease. I'm glad you brought up insulin resistance. That's where I was going next. I think it's really important we get into the nuances there, like metabolic health, often talked about, but I feel like a lot of people still don't fully understand that. And this brings me to the five tests that we talked about earlier. You talk about another test in the book that you recommend, which is fasting insulin. So let's talk about why that is, and then we'll pivot into insulin resistance and why that's at the core of a lot of this. Yeah. So again, a fasting insulin level will show us the process of insulin resistance developing at its early stages. Insulin resistance as a concept, again, not very well understood. And we really don't look at insulin resistance, we look at the end effects of insulin resistance. So the end effects of untreated insulin resistance are things like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure. And these are the conditions that we diagnose people with a problem. Uh, but if we look at insulin resistance itself, we can figure out who is on the pathway to those problems much earlier. We can make the changes that improve it. And we can prevent these problems from occurring in the first place. And, you know, I believe and the data would support that if we were to aggressively treat insulin resistance, we can significantly reduce the amount of heart disease that we experience. Would you argue that insulin resistance is at the core of metabolic health and that those five tests we talked about 
are just another way of looking at insulin resistance in a different way? Yeah, no, that's very much true. You know, all of those changes that occur in those blood, in those metrics that we talked about, the waist circumference, the blood pressure, the blood glucose, the cholesterol profile, those are all because of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the physiologic condition that leads to all of these things. So those metrics are just our way to figure out who is insulin resistant. Um, and so, uh, and again, a fasting insulin level is another indicator that points to insulin resistance. So this is getting to the root cause of troubles instead of the usual approach of the healthcare system these days, which is just trying to treat the symptoms, treat the end effects, and not really thinking about what the underlying process is and how we can address the underlying root cause well, of disease. Well, there's an inherent problem within the five tests, one being that we're looking at blood glucose instead of insulin, right? which, which we know the issue there is that you can control blood glucose to an extent by increasing the insulin produced by the body, and that can go on for years, masking problems. So if you actually go to the insulin, you can get to the root a lot earlier and see what's happening. Yes, definitely so. And that's why I advocate so strongly for people checking their fasting insulin levels, because it is the early indicator. And you're right, all these other things are kind of lagging indicators uh, of the underlying problem. Well, have you continue that story for me where somebody is, will use diet in this case, is neglecting their diet, having a lot of carbohydrates, processed foods, they're not regulating their blood glucose, so their insulin is all over the place. Talk about that insulin resistance piece and what the body does over time and how that leads to disease. Yeah, sure thing. So we need to understand why, you know, what is the role of insulin? What does our body use insulin for? And insulin is a hormone. It's you know, referred to as one of the master hormones of the body. It does lots of different things, but two primary purposes for having insulin are to get sugar out of our bloodstream and to promote storage of energy. Like I talked about, vital for our survival that we're able to store energy. And we know that sugar in high levels in our bloodstream is toxic. It's damaging to our blood vessels, and it has lots of other uh, negative effects when sugar builds up in the bloodstream. So the body uses insulin to get sugar out of the bloodstream and to be able to store energy. And what happens over time is if more and more sugar is coming into the system, the body is producing more and more insulin to get the sugar out of the bloodstream. This causes more and more energy to get stored. And at some point, what happens is those energy storage cells, which are called fat cells, uh, start to get full. And so they stop responding to the insulin. And because, you know, the sugar can't be put away as storage in the fat cells anymore, now it starts to build up in the bloodstream. And so at first, the body just makes more insulin to try and overcome this problem. Uh, this is, you know, but then, you know, it, it's a, uh, sort of vicious cycle. We're making more and more insulin. The cells are responding less and less to that insulin. That's what insulin resistance is. And this now can cause disease in a number of different ways. It's going to cause disease directly because of that sugar building up in the bloodstream. Uh, high levels of insulin, insulin also start to have uh, direct effects on the lining of the blood vessels contributing to that damage. Inflammation occurs contributing to that damage. And the other thing that people sometimes fail to recognize is those lipid particles, those cholesterol particles that we're worried about, they actually get influenced by insulin and they start to change in a number of ways that make them more, we call it atherogenic, more likely to build up in the plaques that are now occurring, you know, as those blood vessel walls are getting damaged. So it turns out that insulin resistance really explains 
the entire disease process, the entire disease continuum. And again, that gives us a much greater opportunity when we focus on the insulin resistance to prevent and even reverse uh, disease once it's occurring. We're really getting into the weeds here, and I really I'm enjoying the nuance to where this is going. The fact that blood sugar has its own problems that it causes in the body, and then insulin, as it continues to be produced more and more, is causing its own set of problems. And the thing about all this, and I think I touched on this quickly, but to get into more on that, the fact that this happens in the body oftentimes over a period of, say, 10 years. So your body is taking care of you, in essence, by making more insulin, getting that blood sugar out of the bloodstream. And it's causing all these this damage in the background that we're not aware of until it's not too late, but until we really have problems. Exactly. Exactly. And and it's really, you know, the healthcare system is designed in such a way, it functions in such a way that we only pick up on these problems, as you said, when they are already advanced. Uh, doesn't mean it's too late, but sometimes it's too late. And other times it's just, you know, far along in the process. And now we have a lot of damage to deal with and to try and, you know, undo and compensate for. And I believe that we should be doing a much better job of diagnosing these things early, trying to reverse and prevent the disease from occurring, then trying to treat disease. Because we have a problem, you know, and this is true here in the United States, this is true worldwide. We are running out of the resources that are necessary to take care of sick people. We have, you know, the, the healthcare system is overwhelmed. Uh, we don't have enough practitioners of all sorts. We don't have enough of the medications that, you know, go into taking care of it, it, you know, into treating these patients in the traditional uh, manner. And we don't have the money, quite frankly, to take care. Uh, you know, this is all becoming more and more expensive and putting a bigger and bigger financial burden on society as a whole. And the only way we're going to get out of that is to make less sick people. Uh, so that is why I so strongly advocate for preventative efforts, for paying attention to these things, for diagnosing them early, evaluating them early, and then giving people the tools, empowering people to take back control of their health, like we talked about earlier, and doing a better job of preventing these problems from occurring in the first place. And we're going to do a good job of that, teaching people what they can do. But before we do that, let's continue this story all the way to the end. And unfortunately, what happens with people is they become, say, 10 years down the line, if they acquire type 2 diabetes at the time, the medical system may prescribe them with insulin and further facilitate this problem. And we know insulin is a growth hormone, so it's going to cause the person to gain weight and it's going to continue this vicious cycle. So further emphasizing what you're talking about here, prevention and giving people the tools so they don't have to go down this path, or if they are, give them another route out of it. Yeah. And, and you know, this is an interesting problem that arose because we were looking at the end effects instead of the root causes. So when we look at diabetes, you know, diabetes is diagnosed when your blood sugar is elevated. And most people are probably aware that we have two forms of diabetes. Uh, traditionally, they were called juvenile onset and mature onset. You know, now we usually call them type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is typically occurs in younger people, and their blood sugar is elevated. And the reason that their blood sugar is elevated is because their bodies have stopped producing insulin. So they have a lack of insulin. This was a fatal disease, uh, very hard to manage prior to the discovery of how to synthesize insulin, uh, you know, um, and then be able to administer insulin to people. And once that was discovered, uh, once we were able to administer insulin to type 1 diabetics, they got a lot better. The management of their disease improved, literally life-saving. Uh, therapy. 
what then started to happen is we had people who were developing high blood sugar later in life. And, you know, we kind of assumed it was the same problem, that they weren't making enough insulin. For whatever reason, they weren't making enough insulin. But the reality is, is that they had been making too much insulin and had developed this insulin resistance. But because our focus is on keeping the blood sugar under control, the answer became give insulin or give other medications that can help lower the blood sugar. And what we really need to step back with people with type 2 diabetes and recognize is that the issue is that they're taking in too much sugar. They're taking in too much carbohydrate. And if you simply reduce the amount of carbohydrate that they're taking in, you can reduce the body's need to produce insulin. And actually, over time, you actually improve insulin sensitivity. The body starts responding to insulin better. But because we focus on the blood sugar, as opposed to focusing on the insulin part of this problem, it has led us to, like you said, uh, a, a sort of nonsensical treatment where people have a problem of too much insulin and we want to give them more insulin. And this all comes back full circle to the five metabolic tests, the fact that we're looking at glucose rather than insulin. So we're looking at glucose and how to control that, but it's the wrong target. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, in an ideal world, insulin, an insulin level would be one of those metabolic health metrics. Um, for whatever reasons, you know, that that did not occur historically and, you know, it has not changed and we're focused on the blood glucose instead of the blood insulin levels. Which is still part of the picture, but... It's, it's just not the full picture. So correct. essentially what we're getting at here and giving clues to is we need to control the insulin. And when it comes to the diet piece, we talked about that being a big lever here. We need to control our carbs. So let's start to get practical here for somebody who right now at this point has been having a standard type diet, having quite a few carbs and their blood glucose and insulin has run amok. Let's talk about what happens when they start to cut those carbs down, control the glucose, and control the insulin. Yeah, so, you know, the effects that we see when people reduce their carbohydrate intake, uh, the first thing, you know, happens usually pretty quickly is their blood sugar levels start to come down. And because we're putting less sugar in, the body requires less insulin to deal with that blood sugar. And over time, the hyperinsulinemia, the high levels of insulin in the bloodstream can be reversed. They get better. And once the cells are being bombarded with so much energy, with so much insulin, uh, and they've been given a chance now to release some of that stored energy, they start responding to insulin better. Uh, so they become more insulin sensitive. And then we can see, you know, all of those downstream effects start to improve. And that is the most powerful way to deal with insulin resistance. We really do not have medications that effectively, you know, reverse insulin resistance. And so this is truly a diet and lifestyle issue. And there are other lifestyle considerations that come into play. Diet is the big one. Diet is the primary one. And I always tell people, if you're not getting the diet right, it's you're not going to be able to overcome that even, no matter how much you focus on the other aspects of this. And the other aspects are things like the activities that you're getting, how much muscle that you have, good, getting good and adequate amounts of sleep, dealing with your stress. These are the other things that, you know, go into the process of improving and maintaining good metabolic health. But diet really has to be the foundation. And since it is the foundation, if somebody comes to work with you and they're, you know, overweight right now, they're insulin resistant, do you recommend just starting with the diet as to keep the person, the changes manageable and not overwhelm them? Well, it's usually the first, you know, aspect that we'll focus on. And I really, I should go back, you know, even before the dietary changes, uh, what I find is important is the mindset. 
the understanding of why you're making these changes. Uh, so, you know, I, I try and educate people on kind of all that we've been talking about. I try them to get to to get them to recognize why their health is so important to them. I want them to take ownership. I want them to have the reasons that they're improving their health because that's what's ultimately going to lead to success. The dietary changes then become the first sort of functional uh, thing we talk about. And again, we do that first because it's most important, uh, and it also impacts the other things. Once they start seeing the changes that occur from making the dietary changes, oftentimes that gives them the ability to be more active, and it you know stimulates them to be more active. Uh, when your blood sugars are better controlled, you sleep better, and so it can take care of that. Uh, there, we are now starting to understand the very important relationship between metabolic health and mental health. And so when we see people improving their diets and going on low-carbohydrate diets, we oftentimes see them getting better from a stress standpoint, uh, them getting better from a mental health standpoint. And so it all starts to reinforce each other. Uh, but ultimately, the most powerful tool we have is the dietary changes. So for somebody that's tuned into this point, they understand now what's happening in the background. You mentioned the mental aspect. They're ready to make a change and they're motivated. We're going to get into dietary nuances here. But the only other roadblock I could see before we get into that is the hope piece. So for somebody who is, say, 300, 350 pounds, They've been, again, really neglectful for, you know, we could argue whether it's, you know, the information being fed down to them or choices they've made. That's, we won't even get into that part. But what have you seen with people? And we, we're going to get into your story eventually. You're an example of this as well. Yeah. But for somebody that's feeling stuck right now and that they're broken, let's give them the hope and then we're going to give them the path they need to take. Yeah, and the hope that I want to give people is that, again, you have control over this. You have power over this. It's never too late to make these changes. I have seen elderly people, you know, 70s, 80s, even into their 90s, make changes and have amazing results. I have seen people with advanced stages of disease, people who have been on my operating table. They, you know, they need the open up, they need the heart surgery that I do. We do the heart surgery, but they make these changes afterwards and they see amazing results. Uh, people who are morbidly obese uh, can see amazing results. Uh, so, you know, and again, this is going to depend on what you're focused on. Uh, I always try and get people to understand that it's not all about weight. Uh, weight loss really becomes a side effect of improving your metabolic health. When you improve your metabolic health, when your insulin level comes down, that is what allows you to lose weight and specifically to lose fat, which is, you know, what our goal is. Uh, so all of these things are, can be improved, can be reversed. Yes, there are situ situations where we have damage that we might not be able to undo uh, fully, but you can always improve from wherever you're starting from. And again, you are in control of this. You can do this for yourself. You need uh, the guides. You need the information that can empower you. But each one of us has the power to do this. And that's the good news. That's the hope that I try and give people every day. Well, let's give people the knowledge. Somebody that is willing to make these dietary changes, we know cutting back on the carbs is a piece of this. How much do we need to do that? Let's take it right from the beginning. Somebody is overweight right now. They've been eating a standard diet. They want to start making shifts. Do you recommend going cold turkey to a certain carb threshold or do you recommend taking things slowly? What would you say? This really needs to be tailored you know, to the individual. And I find that there are two big factors that go into this. Number one is how metabolically broken are you to start with? Um, if you already have type 2 diabetes, you've been insulin resistant for many years, perhaps you have heart disease or early signs of heart disease, 
you are going to need a significant intervention. And, you know, going very low carb right from the beginning is probably, you know, what you need. If, you know, you're not there yet, if you have, you know, maybe your insulin level is a little bit high, maybe one or two of these metabolic health measures are, you know, are, are not in a healthy range, you might be able to, you know, ease into it, you know, just cut your carbohydrates some. Uh, but uh, that's going to be one factor. And the other factor really comes down to like, you know, personality. We all know that some people are the, you know, let's just jump right in, do it 100% and uh, get it done. And other people need that sort of ease in process. What's interesting about the carbohydrates, though, and especially we're talking about the processed carbohydrates, um, is it really does seem to be easier the more you eliminate them. Um, They are addictive. Sugar, we know, is addictive. Processed carbohydrates are addictive. And so, you know, the more you're eating them, the more your body wants them. Uh, And that has to do, you know, there are probably many different aspects of this. There's a psychologic addiction, you know, the physical sort of biochemical addiction in the brain. There are some microbiome effects uh, that, you know, feed some of this. Uh, But whatever it's coming from, we have to recognize that. And so, a lot of people struggle when they just try and moderate their carbohydrate intake and instead they need to eliminate it. And, you know, again, I liken it to, you know, alcohol uh, and people who have addictive issues around alcohol. The message is not moderate your alcohol intake. The message is eliminate alcohol. And really, we can do the same thing with carbohydrates. This is another important concept that people need to understand and that may not be clear because of our messaging. Carbohydrates are not essential to the human diet. We can survive without carbohydrates. We can literally eat zero carbohydrates and survive just fine as human beings. So it is possible, it is an option to completely eliminate carbohydrates in the same way we talk about completely eliminating alcohol. Um, Today, in our modern food environment, that's viewed as extreme. Many nutritionists will tell you that it's an eating disorder if you eliminate, you know, carbohydrates, if you would eliminate one macro from your diet. Uh, But that's not historically true. On an evolutionary standpoint, Um, We have plenty of evidence that we ate very little to zero carbohydrates uh, and survived just fine. In fact, we thrive. Uh, That's how we evolved as human beings, eating fat and protein, not eating carbohydrates. So I want people to understand that complete elimination of carbohydrates is an option. It is safe to do. uh, And despite what you may hear from you know, what are really ill-informed, you know, doctors, nutritionists, uh, health influencers of all sorts that will tell you that carbohydrates are essential, our body needs sugar. What they're confusing is, yes, our body needs sugar. It needs glucose in the bloodstream. You can't have a glucose level of zero, but our body can make all of the glucose it needs. We don't need to eat it uh, for survival. And for somebody that's thinking to themselves, this seems so radical, I could never cut out carbohydrates. A lot of what we're doing in the modern world that's taking us to this level of being overweight and obese is very radical. And sometimes you need to do radical things to correct for radical previous behavior. So, and this doesn't necessarily have to be for life. If you're 350 pounds and you need to come back to baseline, whatever that is for you, maybe you need to do something radical for a period of time and get your health back, get your metabolic health back. And you talk about in the book how you're somebody that doesn't want to be known for never having a bagel or ice cream. You're, you know, you've taken your metabolic health back and now you have room for those things if you choose. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that's an important distinction. If I choose, uh, I am intentional about what I eat. And yes, sometimes I'm going to make that choice uh, for whatever reason. 
knowing that my body can now handle it because I am metabolically healthy. But when I was not metabolically healthy, when I was morbidly obese, and when I was pre-diabetic, my body couldn't handle those things. And so I, you know, was very severe. I, I severely reduced my intake of them. Uh, and today I eat very little of them because, again, I know they're not essential to me. They don't provide any real benefit to me. Uh, and if I eat them in excess, it's going to harm me. It's going to get me back to where I was. So why would I uh, choose to consume something like that? Um, and when you think about it in that context, that is the mindset change uh, that helps people. Uh, and again, if you do it intentionally, if you're thinking about what you're eating, that's going to lead you to success. The problem that I see that gets us into this is that most of us don't actually think about what we eat. There's stuff all around us that we've been told is food, uh, and we just eat it. Um, and that's great if you're the food industry. They're more than happy to keep pushing this food on you that's very profitable, keeps you addictive, keeps you coming back for more, uh, but it's not serving your health. And if your health is important to you, you need to start paying attention to the foods that you're eating. And the other good news about this is that, you know, we don't have to, we've been brainwashed again into thinking that the only way to reverse this problem is with dietary changes that are very hard to maintain, severely reducing your caloric intake, re you know, cutting all the fat out of your diet when fat is in fact essential to life. Uh, and so our bodies actually fight back against these things because, you know, if you're trying to basically starve your body, it's going to fight back. If you're cutting out essential things like fat, it's going to fight back. The body doesn't actually fight back against cutting out carbohydrates because it's not essential. You have to sort of detoxify from them. As I said, there is an addictive component and you have to get through that. But once you do that, the body pretty much says, yeah, we're functioning better like this. You know, we don't need this stuff. And it becomes easy to maintain over a lifetime. It becomes a sustainable way of living. And that's, you know, what we ultimately need. To make sure we're crystal clear here while we talk about carbs, we're using different words such as sugar, processed carbs, carbs. Are those all under the same umbrella for you? Because we could be talking about within that umbrella, processed white sugar or fruit on the other end of the spectrum. So when somebody decides to make this shift, is there a difference there between the two? Well, you know, ultimately there really isn't a, a difference uh, in the sense of it all gets turned into the same sugar when our body metabolizes it. The difference is, 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 is in the degree of harm that comes from it. Uh, because of the more processed it is, basically what that means is that it can get into our bloodstreams quicker. Um, and it, you know, it oftentimes is then also combined with other things that are going to be harmful. We haven't really even started talking about, you know, the uh, vegetable and the seed oils, the processed oils, processed fats that have been introduced into our diet and play a role in all of this. Uh, so, Ultimately, yeah, all carbohydrates are the same. If you are metabolically broken, if your metabolic health is not good, if you are insulin resistant, you cannot handle carbohydrate no matter what form it is. If it's a fruit or if it's a box of Oreos, it's all sugar. Uh, and you need to be careful about uh, how much sugar and carbohydrate you're taking in. Now, if you're metabolically healthy and you want to incorporate some carbohydrate into your diet, again, now we have a spectrum of how damaging these things are going to be. And yes, of course, I would prefer you have the fruit, the unprocessed carbohydrates, rather than, you know, the heavily processed carbohydrates. There is going to be a, a difference in how your body responds to that and, you know, how likely to damage your metabolism, those things are. So 
you know, you'll oftentimes hear people say, well, no one becomes fat or no one becomes insulin resistant from eating fruit. Uh, and yeah, if fruit is the only carbohydrate in your diet, you're right. You're probably not going to get to that point of insulin resistance or being obese. But once you are obese, once you are insulin resistant, your body, you know, is just as, uh, uh, just as impaired in its ability to handle the fruit as it is the bread and the pasta and the Oreo cookies. And just to make sure people are following, tying this back to what we talked about before, when we ingest those carbs, they become sugar in our system, raising our blood sugar, and then the insulin's going to spike to take care of that blood sugar and bring it back down. If we abuse that over time and continue to spike our blood sugar, we're going to make more and more insulin trying to get rid of the sugar and put it into the cells. And over time, we're going to have problems with the blood sugar and become insulin resistant. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's a good way of summarizing it. And, you know, and again, this is not straightforward stuff. There's a lot that goes into this. And this is why I recommend finding someone to guide you through this process, a good practitioner uh, that can help you with this, whether it's a doctor or a nutritionist or some other uh, type of practitioner, but they have to understand insulin resistance. They have to understand metabolic health and help you translate that into, you know, how you live your life day to day. One thing you're really careful to do in your book is not be really prescriptive when it comes to diet. So, I just want to make sure we're practical, though, with people here when they're thinking about carbs. Do you have a certain number that you like to work with when somebody jumps in, like keeping the carbs below this many grams a day? And if you do, is that net or total? Yeah, so I don't really uh, accept or believe the concept of net versus total carbs. Uh, again, I think that's a food industry manipulation to try and get some of this stuff and say that, oh, well, it's okay because it's this type of carb and not this type of carb. Uh, so I look at total carbs. And for someone who is not in optimal metabolic health, my recommendation is usually going to be under 50 grams of carbs a day. Uh, and again, that's with the understanding that you can certainly go a lot lower than that. And the lower you go, probably the quicker you're going to see a response, the better you're going to see a response. And some people, you know, respond exceptionally well to very low carbohydrate diets like a carnivore diet. And again, there are also other things that go into this whole um, equation. You know, metabolic health, uh, insulin resistance, very important concept. But we also have to keep in mind things like autoimmune diseases that can be triggered by certain foods that we eat, uh, gut problems, leaky gut syndrome that people probably have heard about caused by certain foods that we eat. So, you know, if you have these types of factors that are playing into your overall health picture, you might require something different. Um, as you mentioned, you know, in the book and in my practice, I work with lots of different dietary strategies because there are different dietary strategies that you can implement to meet these goals. Uh, but you have to understand the underlying issues that you're dealing with, the underlying physiology, and then apply them appropriately. Uh, you know, and as, as much as I, you know, am not a big fan of medication-based treatment, you know, we can look at something like medications and we can say, okay, if we're trying to treat a certain medical condition, we usually have multiple types of medications that can be applied to that situation. And we pick, you know, which flavor of medicine based on certain factors about that disease. And I view metabolic health and dietary changes as the same way. There is no one right answer for everyone. Um, when I wrote the book, I intentionally didn't write, you know, Dr. Ovedia's diet plan, Dr. Ovedia's 28-day diet plan, like we see out there so much. Uh, my focus is on insulin resistance and metabolic health. And whatever dietary strategy works for you to improve insulin resistance and improve metabolic health, I'm going to be in favor of. And for some people, that's a plant-based vegan diet. And for other people, that's a carnivore diet. 
two what would seem to be opposite ends of the spectrum, but they both can work. And the reason that they both can work is because you're eliminating processed food, you're eliminating highly processed carbohydrates, and you know, you're know you getting success. Now, there are other factors that go into why I favor animal protein-based approaches rather than plant-based approaches, but Ultimately, if someone says for whatever reason, you know, I want to be plant-based, I'm going to say, great. If you're improving your metabolic health with your plant-based diet, I'm all in favor of it. But if you're not, we have to take a look at some things and, and figure out what we need to adjust to improve your metabolic health. Coming back to that term, total versus net carbs, for anybody that hasn't heard of net carbs, what they're doing there is taking total carbs and subtracting the fiber to come up with that number. So you yeah, mentioned the, you're not a fan of that, but I just wanted for completeness yeah. for people to understand. Uh, but also understand that it's not just fiber that they substitute, that they subtract out. They'll also substitute out what are called sugar alcohols, um, which are another type of uh, sugar substitute, basically. So again, it, you know, this is really driven by the food industry that wants to be able to, uh, you know, uh, proclaim that their some of their foods are low carb. You know, it's a marketing ploy, basically, uh, to say it's ketogenic or it's low carb. And because it has lower net carbs, because uh, we subtracted out this other stuff, it doesn't count. And really, you know, uh, uh, again... Most of the food that we should be eating, it shouldn't have a label on it. It shouldn't have a nutritional, you know, you shouldn't need the nutritional uh, ingredient list there. And you shouldn't be saying, well, this ingredient counts, this one doesn't count. The vast majority of the food that we eat, it should be basically single ingredients that we have combined that you look at it, you know what's in it. And you don't need a label to tell you it's, you know, keto or low carb or low fat, or whatever it is. Let's come back to that carnivore versus vegan piece, because when you said that, it really jumped out at me, well, how easy it would be as a carnivore to be low carb. And again, I want to make sure we come back to other elements of the diet besides carbs, because that's only one part of that whole story. Yeah. But before we do, when it comes to a plant-based diet, let's stick with vegan, because there's a lot of gray in that area when people start going vegetarian, vegan, or plant-based using different terms. So we'll stick with vegan. Inherently, there's going to be a lot of carbohydrates on a typical vegan diet. For somebody you're working with, it sounds like you've worked with people that have done this successfully. How would somebody adopt a diet like that without going high on the carbs? Yeah, so low carb plant based is very challenging, but it can be done with proper planning. Um, one of my uh, concerns about vegan diets is that there are it is mandatory to supplement certain things. Uh, there are essential nutrients uh, that we cannot get from plants, and, and again, the most staunch vegan advocate would not um, would not argue that point. Um, it, it, it's not a debatable point. You can say, okay, I'm just going to choose to take supplements and that's a choice and that, you know, uh, may work for you. Uh, but vegan diets by definition are going to be nutritionally deficient in certain elements. Uh, and like I said, you can make it work. If you're trying to do a low carb vegan diet, very difficult to do. Uh, so the reason that vegan diets uh, can sometimes help to improve insulin resistance um, it typically is because of their caloric reduction. Um, their you're just taking in less energy. Uh, but if you're starting metabolically unhealthy, I find it's very hard uh, to get improvement with a vegan diet. Um, if you're starting from a metabolically healthy place, uh, the vegan diets can help to, you know, can sustain metabolic health. Uh, but I, I have not seen nearly the success of overcoming insulin resistance with vegan diets that I see with low carb diets in general. Uh, and so um, it's doable. It's very difficult. Uh, I have worked with some people on it and, you know, you can do it. It just takes a lot of planning. It's a lot more uh, intensive uh, I'll say, t 
to try and do it with a plant-based approach uh, rather than with an approach that incorporates animal proteins. So you have or you haven't seen somebody reverse insulin resistance on a vegan diet? I have not personally worked with any vegans that have reversed insulin resistance. Uh, I There are some people out there who talk about it. Um, I've worked with plant-based people who are already, you know, are starting from a place of insulin sensitivity and, uh, you know, they can configure their diet in such a way that they can maintain insulin sensitivity at least over shorter periods of time. Uh, but, um, no, I, I can't say that I have personally worked with someone, uh, that came to me insulin resistant, instituted a vegan diet and, and, uh, reversed their insulin resistance. Uh, the one thing that is positive about a true plant-based diet, um, and again, this is where, again, you get into the nuance of the terms, uh, because, you know, technically Oreos are vegan. Uh, we see all of this processed food that's vegan, the fake meat products. These are all vegan. Uh, people who are eating a plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet that are eliminating processed food, they are going to see improvement because of that elimination of processed food. And again, this gets into the other part of the discussion that it's not just the carbohydrates in the processed food that are harmful. It's some of the other things that are in processed food that are harmful as well. And elimination of those also seems to have a great impact on improving metabolic health. So let's stick with somebody then that you've worked with that is metabolically healthy and they're maintaining that through a vegan diet. I'm just so curious on what a day's eating could look like. Can you give us an idea? Because are they just putting a ton of fat into the diet? Like, I can't even picture what that would look like eating yeah. a day vegan. That would be low carb. Yeah. So they're usually uh, getting fat from, um, you know, coconut oil and olive oil primarily, maybe avocado you'll throw in there. Uh, so again, the non-seed oils, those are like the fruit-based oils. Uh, their protein sources are coming from, you know, vegan protein sources. Uh, and again, very challenging to get the right balance of proteins. There are certain amino acids uh, that it's very challenging to get from plant-based uh, sources. Uh, and, you know, they are keeping their carbohydrates typically under about 100 grams a day. So not what a lot of us would consider to be a very low carbohydrate diet, but it is low carbohydrate when, you know, comparison to the average Western diet, the standard American diet, which is usually about 300 grams of carbohydrate a day. Uh, so I would call it a relatively low carbohydrate diet. It's not going to be, you know, a super low uh, carbohydrate diet like a carnivore or, or a typical ketogenic diet is. But again, if you're coming from a place of, of good metabolic health, if you're very physically active, you know, you're probably going to be able to tolerate 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. And so, you know, within that 100 grams of carbs, you can construct a diet that's going to support, uh, you know, your, your needs uh, as a vegan. We're going to come up on the carnivore diet, which I know your diet is similar to that. But we'll put carbs aside for a few minutes here and talk about some of these other aspects that you brought up, starting with the oils. So somebody that hasn't been cognizant of the oils they're including when they're cooking or eating, making salads, let's talk about the dangerous ones and how to go about switching those out for better choices. Yeah. So the vegetable and the seed oils, uh, which are processed oils, are what we need to be careful of, what we need to eliminate from the diet. Uh, and these are going to be things like canola oil, vegetable oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, uh, peanut oils. Um, and the, what, what's really challenging about this is that many of these oils literally have a stamp on the bottle that say they are heart healthy. They are endorsed by the American Heart Association. And so when I tell people that not only are these not heart healthy, but they're actually damaging to your heart, to your metabolic health, that is one, you know, that is still something that very much confuses people. Uh, but understand that these are industrial oils that were modified and introduced into the, our food stream 
within the past 100 to 150 years. Our bodies did not evolve eating these oils, and our bodies cannot metabolize these oils. So what happens when we eat these oils is they get incorporated, um, again, fat, fats, and, and the dietary fats that we eat uh, get converted to fatty acids in our body. We call it all fat, but it's not all the same stuff, so it gets very confusing when you try and explain this. Um, but, you know, those fatty acids are then put into cholesterol molecules. Uh, those become part of our uh, cellular structure. They literally, you know, make up the membrane that encases a cell. Uh, they go into our mitochondria, which are the energy uh, factories within, it, within the cells where our energy gets made. And our bodies can't really process them. They sort of put them in because they look a little bit like the animal fats that we evolved eating. Uh, but over time, these build up and become, you know, they're another um, damaging substance within our food supply that leads to some of these metabolic problems. And, you know, um, explaining why gets very complex very quickly. We start to get into cellular levels. We start to get into what happens in the mitochondria, you know, how all these cellular uh, and chemical reactions occur that ultimately end up generating the energy. Uh, but for most people, what I tell them is it, it literally can break your mitochondria. It can break your cellular um, mechanisms for generating energy. And this is another thing that ultimately is going to lead to insulin resistance and poor metabolic health. So I strongly advocate for eliminating vegetable and seed oils as they're known. And again, even that term, we have to realize that vegetable oil is a marketing term. These things don't come from vegetables. Uh, it, it really was a marketing decision to call them vegetable oils because people we're led to believe that vegetables are healthy for us and therefore vegetable oils must be healthy for us. And they're not. Uh, so they are so ubiquitous in our food supply. This is what becomes the problem. And why do I say you need to eliminate all processed food? Because almost all processed food, almost everything that comes in a box or a bag and has that nutritional label on it, if you look at those ingredients, you're going to find these vegetable and seed oils in them. The food industry loves vegetable and seed oils because they are cheap to produce uh, and they increase profit margins of those foods. And so that's why they love them. And when they were first introduced into our food supply, you know, when they were first tested for human consumption, they don't kill you right away. You know, they're not overtly poisonous. So we said, okay, we can eat them. The food industry said, great, you know, we have this product that, you know, increases our uh, food, uh, increases our profit margins and, you know, has other properties that make it applicable uh, to using in the food supply at large quantities. And so they were happy with it. And what we didn't realize was the long-term effects of eating these things. And when you're eating these things over many period over many years, again, they break our cellular uh, metabolism, and they lead to health these health problems, insulin resistance, uh, and poor metabolic health. And that's why I advocate for eliminating processed food, because outside of processed food, you're really not going to get these things. Using them as cooking oils is another thing that we really want to get away from. And we want to get back to what we commonly used as cooking uh, fats throughout our ancestral history. And these are the animal-based fats. These are things like lard and tallow. These are things like butter and ghee uh, that, you know, our bodies can use and evolved using. And those are the fats that I advocate for people to incorporate into their diets. You went where I was going to go. The fact that it is going to be a big shift for a lot of people to eliminate processed foods and maybe switch up a few of the oils that they're cooking with in their kitchen, but there's not a lot of entry points of those oils when we make those switches. So 
luckily when you learn, you can you can eliminate those couple of areas and then get that out of your life. Although the point I want to ask you about a challenge for all of us that are health conscious and trying to make better decisions is when we go out to eat. We have no idea what they're using when you order a salad or anything. They can be using the oils to cook and do all different things in the kitchen. And how do you go about eating out when it comes to oils? Yeah. So in general, uh, you know, if you're not ordering fried foods, uh, you're going to minimize your exposure. You know, most of the fried foods, including things like French fries, are going to be fried in vegetable and seed oils. So you want to, uh, you know, that's an kind of easier fix to make. Now, you know, you might order the steak and they might be using vegetable and seed oil to, you know, coat the grill uh, uh, to make that steak. Um, what you're told is butter, you know, might not be real butter. Uh, you can ask the questions. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'll oftentimes tell people to do when they're eating out is say, you know, I'm sensitive, uh, I'm allergic to vegetable and seed oils, I can't have them in my diet, you know, and, and you can kind of start to prompt them what's in this. Uh, if it's a salad dressing, you almost have to assume that it's going to have vegetable and seed oil. So just ask for the dressing on the side or, you know, ask them, you know, is this a homemade dressing? What do you put in it? Uh, and, and usually restaurants are going to be responsive to that, uh, you know, uh, and will accommodate you and work with you. But the safest thing to do is, you know, to order, you know, meats that are just grilled, uh, vegetables that are maybe just, you know, sauteed in butter. Ask what they're sauteed in or, or again, maybe grilled with some butter over them. Uh, these simple things that are going to minimize your exposure to the vegetable and seed oils. But you're right. If you're eating out, it's nearly impossible to have 100%, uh, you know, perfect, uh, not getting any vegetable and seed oils. Uh, and, and again, in minimal quantities that you might get in that situation, it, it probably not a big deal. Uh, but you want to do your best to avoid getting it in large quantities. And when you're eating out, those are typically going to come in fried food. They're going to come in in salad dressings, uh, and they might come in, you know, other sauces and stuff. So you just try and minimize your exposure to all that as you're as you're ordering. That makes sense. And coming back to the good fats, butter. We have tallow. We have lard, ghee. Those are the ones you mentioned. How do you compare those to some of the quote unquote healthy oils that come from plants? olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil. Yeah. Those get a free pass in the health world. How do you look at the difference between animal versus plant fat? But the three that I named, we're not talking about vegetable and seed oils. Right. Yeah. So those plant fats uh, that you mentioned, the difference between them and the vegetable and seed oils that we were talking about is that those fats actually come from the fruit of the plant itself. They don't require the processing to extract it and to make it palatable uh, for humans to eat. Uh, so, you know, that's why they seem to be less harmful. And again, I don't have much problem with them. Uh, you know, so we'll, we're, this is sort of evolving us to talk about, you know, do you need to be 100% carnivore or not? And the answer that I give people to that question is typically, again, it's going to depend on where you're starting from and what you're trying to uh, accomplish and deal with. Uh, if you have an autoimmune condition, we need to recognize that that is typically going to be triggered by something in your diet that is coming from the plant kingdom. And so the best way to deal with that is probably going to be a carnivore diet uh, as an elimination diet. And as you heal, you might start to reintroduce things. Now, again, similar to what I talked about with carbohydrates, Plants are not essential to human life. Humans can exist as pure carnivores. We can get all of the nutrients that we need from animal products. Uh, so it is not essential to eat plants. You might choose to eat plants. They might be not harmful to you, but for certain people, they are harmful and they do need to be eliminated. So again, I try to get people to understand that carnivore is an option. Doesn't mean everyone needs to be carnivore. Now, I maintain a carnivore diet. 
uh, because, quite frankly, I find it easy to do. I find it satisfying. I enjoy eating meats. And, you know, it, it's just a lot easier for me to maintain my metabolic health on a carnivore diet. Uh, carnivore diets, you really don't have to track anything. You're not worried about your macros. You're really not doing a whole lot of planning. I just have, you know, ample amounts of meat in my freezer and my refrigerator here. I get home from a long day of work. I grab something. Typically, I throw it on a grill or I throw it in a pan for a few minutes. I eat and I'm done. There's no waste. There's no cleanup. There's no recipe. There's no, you know, uh, it, it, it just is really easy. It's satisfying. It keeps me um, from being hungry, typically on an animal-based diet, high in protein, uh, you know, with, with good amounts of fat. I only get hungry once or twice a day, so I only have to eat once or twice a day. And that's why, you know, I maintain my carnivore diet. Thankfully, I don't have any of the autoimmune issues that makes it necessary for me to do so. Uh, but some people do, and that's, you know, where a carnivore diet comes into play. And again, what I try to get people to understand is that a carnivore diet is a healthy diet. It is a heart healthy diet. So um, I want people to understand that you can do it. Uh, and there's no reason to fear a carnivore diet. Again, like many of the mainstream, you know, nutritionists and, you know, cardiologists uh, will tell you uh, this concept that meat is harmful to our health is absolutely bunk. Uh, it just does not hold up to scientific scrutiny. It is all associational, um, you know, things that are blamed on meat when we're eating meat in the context of a standard Western diet with all these processed foods. You know, so when people eat a hamburger, typically that hamburger is going to have the bun and it's going to have the toppings and it's going to have the French fries with it and they're going to drink the soda with it and again, for various reasons, not all scientifically driven, we turn that into, look how bad that hamburger is for your health. Look how bad that meat is for your health. And it never was the meat that was causing the damage. It was the other stuff. Uh, so a carnivore diet can be healthy, uh, can support your heart health, your metabolic health. It is probably closest to our evolutionarily you know, evolutionary diet, what we evolved as humans eating. And that's why I strongly advocate for, you know, a, a animal based, animal based protein diet. And what makes your message so powerful is the fact that you are a heart surgeon. You're somebody who's in the trenches, you know, seeing the plaque in people's arteries and, and helping them clear that out. Typically, the people, your colleagues would be the people that would be talking about a 180, what we're talking about here today. So I just think it's really powerful. The fact that you are somebody who has the background, who's working with patients and this is what you've come to. Yeah. And, and, and you also have a story of your own, which I don't want to, I want you to share your thought there, but then I want to get into that. So you've come at this from personal experience as well. Yeah, definitely. And before we get to that personal experience, you know, what I want to mention is I have seen patients, I have worked with patients who have implemented these diets and have vastly improved their health up to and including the reversal of coronary plaque, of plaque in their arteries. We have seen regression. Uh, we have certainly seen progression stop. Uh, we have seen vast improvements in metabolic health in the patients that I work with. So, you know, and, and again, this kind of gets dismissed, you know, and they'll say, oh, well, that's just a N equals one, you know, example. It just is a one off. Uh, but, you know, we see more and more and more of these occurring. And how many N equals ones is it going to take for our medical system, our healthcare system to start accepting uh, that these are healthy diets that do support optimal metabolic health. And they certainly address the underlying issue, the insulin resistance. Uh, and so that's why I so strongly advocate for uh, understanding that this is one of the options that you can use. 
as we get into carnivore, let's take a step back and and get into your story now. Going all the way back to when you were a hundred pounds heavier, yep. morbidly obese. Yep. You wouldn't be saying any of the current stuff that we're talking about today. You're very conventional minded. Take us back to that time and talk about what your lifestyle and diet was like. And then we'll go through the evolution to where you are today. Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, I uh, you know, this is throughout my early career as a heart surgeon, you know, the first uh, 10 plus years as a heart surgeon, I was increasingly unhealthy. I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was destined for my own operating table. I had all, I had the whole story, family history. My grandmother, you know, uh, battled with and died of heart disease. Uh, my dad has undergone heart surgery. Uh, so, you know, all of the boxes were being checked. And I didn't know what to do because I had tried and I was following the advice that I had learned to give, uh, you know, counting my calories, eating less, moving more, eating a low fat diet. I had had some short term successes like many people have. I'd lose some weight and then I would end up gaining back the weight and more. And it was only when I started getting exposed to different information uh, and started learning about elimination of sugar, elimination of carbohydrates, you know, low carbohydrate diets and ultimately carnivore diets, uh, that my personal health improved. Uh, and, you know, that I have been able to undo all of that. Um, I no longer struggle with obesity. Uh, I have lost 100 pounds. I have maintained that weight loss, uh, you know, now for we're, we're over seven years at this point into this journey. Uh, I am literally in the best shape of my life. I have more energy than I did, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I wear smaller clothes today than I did in high school. And uh, so it has had a vast impact on my personal health. And now I have seen patient after patient uh, that I've been working with uh, get similar improvements. And, you know, that's why I'm doing everything that I do. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I have my telemedicine practice to work with people on this, coaching programs, courses, coming on podcasts like this and running my own podcast because my mission is to get this information to as many people as possible and to help them to take back control of their health. You talked about the fact that making meals is easy for you following this this diet. The weight loss speaks for itself. So we're hearing about, you know, all the different positive aspects of this this new diet. Not new, but I guess within that seven year range. How long have you been carnivore? Is it two or three years? I've been carnivore now for four years. Um, yeah. And I really started my journey through the various flavors of low carb you know, low carb, keto, all of that stuff uh, started now uh, seven years ago. What I was getting at with all that is, do you find with this diet, there are any specific challenges or it's just become easier in all realms? No, it, it really, you know, uh, again, it just becomes your lifestyle. Uh, and, you know, most of the challenges that people sort of perceive or come to me with, uh, you know, just get overcome. Uh, and, you know, they, they ask about things like, well, how do you eat out? How do you travel? Uh, which are things that I do, you know, uh, a lot, the travel especially, the eat out less so. But uh, these are all things that I incorporate into my life without issues. Uh, you know, you can work around all this stuff. One of the most powerful things I find about the carnivore diet and really this applies to low-carb diets in general, uh, is the hunger control. Um, and so when you're hungry less often, you can be better about making those intentional choices. You know, one of the reasons that I think in day-to-day -day life, most people make such poor choices around the food that they're eating is because they're hungry all the time. So they just need to grab whatever's around them to eat to keep their, you know, keep their hunger at bay. Hunger is one of the most powerful human instincts that we have. You, you really cannot resist hunger. You know, we talk about willpower 
And again, this goes back to the traditional dieting approach that makes you more hungry. And, you know, over time, you simply cannot restrict, you cannot resist that because hunger is one of our basic survival instincts. Uh, so when you eat in a way like a carnivore diet that makes you hungry less often, that is a very powerful tool. So if I'm in situations where there just isn't, you know, what I consider to be good food available, I'm okay with going a little longer, not eating. Uh, and that that makes it a lot easier to negotiate things like travel, for instance. Uh, but, you know, even within even, you know, forgetting that for a minute, uh, there really isn't situations where you can't find something to eat that's going to be carnivore. You know, almost every restaurant serves burgers and steaks. And, you know, so you just eat the burger and you tell them, I don't want the topping. I don't want the buns. Uh, and people are going to be like, well, you know, how do they react to that? Honestly, no one even blinks an eye at it anymore. Um, you know, I think low carbohydrate has become accepted enough into society, still not nearly mainstream, but it's accepted enough that no one really looks at it. And, and, you know, if, if they accidentally bring you the burger on the bun, you just put the bun on the side, you eat the burger and you're good to go. Uh, and so, um, it is very easy to do in day to day life. Um, you know, I think most people would say that I lead a very busy, uh, you know, hectic life as a heart surgeon, running, a you know, running businesses, uh, doing all of the stuff that I do, um, and I'm able to make it work, and it actually facilitates all the things that I do because I'm not thinking about food as much, and I'm not stopping to eat, you know, as much. Uh, so, uh, and I have endless energy. Uh, that's one of the other great things about low carbohydrate diets, about improving your metabolic health. You find energy improves, your mental clarity improves, and it really does allow you to function better. As you talk about the fact that you're not hungry and you have this energy, it gets me thinking about intermittent fasting. And it sounds like, and I know you talk about this briefly in your book, you're not a fan of overtly doing that. Would you say for people that haven't adopted a full carnivore diet, though, there would be benefits if there's still, you know, a moderate amount of carbohydrates? Because again, this all comes back to insulin resistance, yep. not spiking the glucose. There's two different avenues when it comes to diet that we can attack that one being having windows where we're not eating, letting blood glucose come down. Yep. And the other being having lower carb foods. So in your case, maybe fasting wouldn't be as applicable so I'll have you talk about that. And then for somebody who is having more, a moderate amount of carbs, would you say that tool would be more apl applicable in that case? Yeah. So reducing your frequency of eating is certainly a powerful tool in improving metabolic health. And again, it's not that I'm not a fan of intermittent fasting. Um, I just don't think it's the first lever necessarily to pull because if you get into that situation where you're trying to force your way through it and you're hungry, as I said, that becomes very difficult to maintain over the long term. So I try to go at it from the other approach, and I tell people, find a way to eat that's going to make you hungry less often. And, you know, low carbohydrates do that very well. Uh, you don't have to be full carnivore, uh, you know, to, to get those benefits. I find most people on low carbohydrate ketogenic diets, over time, they just become hungry less often. At the beginning, one thing that I point out to people, though, is that you may get more hungry at first uh, because when you've eliminated the processed food and you're starting to give your body nutrient-dense food, your body craves that. It wants more of that. It wants to recover from the nutrient deficiencies that many of us have on processed food diets. And so you might get more hungry at first. And I also tell people, you know, don't fear that. Sometimes you do uh, sort of lean into it. And and those are the situations where I don't necessarily want people forcing themselves to fast for certain periods of time uh, because, you know, that can get us into a situation where it's just not sustainable. And ultimately, you get so hungry that you just, you know, all of a sudden you're eating stuff that you don't want to be eating necessarily. So, 
Uh, that's my message around the fasting part of it. But intermittent fasting, fasting, even longer fasts, which sometimes I use with people as well, can be very powerful tools for improving your metabolic health. How do you feel about food quality? As somebody that's eating primarily meat, are you concerned about getting organic, free range, grass-fed, grass-finished? Or for you, is that very secondary? Yeah. So, um, you know, it is a secondary concern. Uh, and again, what I tell people is find the animal protein, find the meat that's accessible to you, uh, affordable to you. I'd rather have you eating, you know, lower quality, what's perceived as lower quality meats than eating processed food. Uh, so, um, if it's just not available in your area, if it's not affordable to you, um, you know, I know many people who have had great success doing carnivore-based diets on, you know, what would be considered low-quality meat. You know, the ground beef that you get for two ninety-nine, three ninety-nine a pound, uh, you know, in the supermarket or in the bulk, you know, uh, amounts. Uh, but there are ways of getting higher-quality meats at lower prices. Um, you know, connect with a local rancher, uh, go direct to the source. Uh, and that can save a lot of money when you cut out the middleman. If you can buy it in bulk, if you have the ability to store it, uh, you know, and you can buy a quarter cow or a half cow at a time, you can get a really great value on higher quality meats. Um, ultimately, when we look from a nutritional standpoint, the difference between, you know, ideal grass fed, regeneratively raised, uh, you know, beef versus the kind of standard, you know, what many, what we call CAFO beef, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the large quantity uh, beef raising uh, organizations, that nutritional difference is actually relatively small compared to the nutritional difference between beef in general and, you know, processed food. So you have to make it work in your life. Uh, and again, it can be very affordable because you're eating less frequently. Um, it becomes more affordable, you know, because you're wasting less. People don't really recognize, you know, how much of the processed food, uh, you know, that we end up throwing out, uh, you know, how much waste there is in that system. Uh, you know, you're eating and, and again, how much of it your body is actually utilizing, uh, you know, our body is able to optimally extract the nutrients from animal products. We're not able to extract it from plant products. A lot more of the plant products that we eat pass through us and, you know, out the other end uh, than with animal products. So that's another factor that goes into this. Uh, so when people are thinking about affordability, you have to consider all those factors and the final factor that should go into your affordability equation is what's it costing you in the long term to eat that processed food? Yes, that processed food is cheap now, but what's it costing you in the long term? If you're going to be sick, if you're going to be requiring medications, if you're going to have reduced quality of life, you know, what is that worth to you? And that really, you know, balance that against the investment that you might have to make in eating higher quality, non-processed food. There's so many different variables. Yeah. Long-term costs, uh, nutrition, you touched on those. There's also the things we're not getting when we buy organic, the things that could be in the meat, you know, different toxins, antibiotics, different things. And then you mentioned CAFO, how the animals are treated. That's another whole... There, so there's a lot of different variables and people need to be aware of them all and then make the best decision within their budget. Right. So I'll give you a hypothetical situation. You're working with somebody, they're buying into what we're talking about today, but for whatever reason, they're not going to go all the way to carnivore, not you know in that realm that you are. It sounds like you're in that realm, but not totally. What I'm getting at here is when it comes to plants, do you have a hierarchy of things that are acceptable and then ones that are all the way down here that are toxic and we should avoid? Basically, for somebody that's going to include some plants for whatever reason, maybe it's just to be inclusive with the family and be able to eat a wider range at dinner with the family. 
what are some plants you'd say all of us need to avoid? And then what are the plants that are okay in moderation? Yeah. So again, I think this is going to depend on what your, um, what problem you're solving. Uh, so, you know, there are many different aspects of plants that might be problematic. Uh, one of them is the carbohydrate amount, like we talked about. So, you know, for people who are just trying to institute a low carbohydrate approach to improve their insulin resistance, you know, just look for the plants that are lower in carbohydrates. Uh, these are going to be things like cruciferous vegetables, green leafy vegetables, uh, you know, and uh, you're going to avoid maybe some of the higher carb uh, plant products, things like potatoes and, and tomatoes and, and carrots, for instance. Um, if you're coming at it from an autoimmune issue, uh, you're going to have a different focus there. Uh, and we start getting into things like oxalates uh, and uh, lectins and some of these plant toxins uh, that can trigger immune reactions in certain people. So, you know, as you're thinking about your diet, these are all the various considerations that come into play. Um, if you're just coming to me and you're insulin resistant and you're obese and you're trying to lose weight and you just want to do a low carbohydrate diet, then we're going to talk about what the low carbohydrate vegetable options are. And, you know, no issues. Have at it. Uh, if you're coming to me with autoimmune conditions, we're going to have a different discussion. So this is where, you know, we get into there's no one right diet that I can recommend for everyone. It really, you have to start taking into account all of these different um, issues and what are the problems that you're solving for and where are you starting from? Coming back to that family piece, you've talked a lot about your diet now and how you eat. Does your family eat a similar diet or are you on your own in this realm? Yeah, no, they eat, you know, uh, I would say a low carbohydrate, you know, not strict carnivore, you know, not as nearly carnivore as I am. But again, what does that look like practically? What that looks like practically is that, you know, I throw a bunch of steaks on the grill, uh, you know, and my kids love steak. Uh, and, you know, my wife and my kids might, you know, make some broccoli to have with the steak. Uh, they might make a baked potato to have with the steak. You know, again, uh, they're not obese. They're not metabolically broken, uh, you know, like the background that I was coming from. Uh, so, you know, and I might have, you know, a lot more steak and they have a little, you know, less steak with some of the side stuff. But there's no reason that this can't be, you know, a very easily incorporated into everyone's everyday life. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it is accessible to people. It is, you know, you can do this. Uh, and, you know, one of the things you just have to turn off is all the messaging telling you the reasons that you can't do this and shouldn't do this. And, you know, if you're hearing your doctors tell you, well, you can't eat steak because it's bad for your heart, that's the messaging you need to turn off uh, and understand that steak is not bad for your heart. Low carbohydrate diets are not bad for your heart. They are not bad for your health. Uh, so this is the messaging that I am working so hard to get out there. How does somebody go about finding a doctor at best that advocates like this or at worst, at least acknowledges that you want to eat and, and behave in this way, your lifestyle and supports you, even though it might not be totally aligned? Yeah, so uh, that is, you know, one of the most common questions that I get asked, and it can be very challenging. You know, the good news is, is that we have resources like we have today. You know, we have podcasts like this that, you know, you can ask your doctor to listen to, or, you know, you can listen to yourself. Um, we have the internet, so you can get on the internet, you can search for you know, low carbohydrate doctors in my area. Uh, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners uh, is an organization that is trying to uh, consolidate some of the resources uh, and identify the practitioners that are interested in metabolic health. And you can ask your doctors these questions. You know, you can go to your doctor and say, you know, I have high blood pressure that you diagnosed me with. You've started me on a medication. 
Why do I have the high blood pressure? Am I insulin resistant? Um, what tests can we do to figure that out? And if they're not able to help you, find a doctor that can. Um, you know, find the resources and bring them to your doctor. You know, I'll selfishly say, buy them a copy of my book, uh, you know, and take it, you know, and ask them to read it. Now, unfortunately, some doctors just aren't willing to do that. They're not willing to consider that they might be wrong about things. And I understand that, you know, uh, that is very difficult for us to admit. Uh, but it's something we need to admit because the bottom line is we are not getting the results that we need to be getting for our patients. Um, I cannot accept the fact that heart disease continues to be the number one killer in the United States 70 years after we declared war on heart disease. Uh, so um, I need to do better for my patients, and I hope most doctors would feel the same, but understand that doctors are trapped within a system that just does not realize the importance of this, does not support this. And that's why I go back to people advocating for their own health. Ultimately, your doctor should not and cannot force you to do something, um, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I, in my role as a heart surgeon, I'll have conversations with people and it's clear that heart surgery is their best option for improving their life or saving their life. And sometimes, for whatever reason, they say no. They don't want the heart surgery that can save their life or vastly improve their life. It is not my role to force that person to have heart surgery. It's my role to understand where they're coming from, educate them on their options, and ultimately, whatever option they decide that's what I need now to work with them on, on how best we can improve their health within that context. And if they say, okay, I do not want heart surgery. I understand everything you're telling me. My answer is, okay, let's figure out what's best for you. Uh, and I hope that doctors, you know, would treat their patients the same. I understand that sometimes they don't. And that's when you need to take the control and say, you know what? I'm finding another doctor. And that might mean traveling. That might mean, you know, going online. That might mean spending some money because your insurance company is locking you into a certain set of doctors. And you might need to go outside that. But again, investing in your health, I think, is the most worth worthwhile investment you can find. And that also might mean that you just, you know, get on the internet and you find this content, you listen to this podcast, you read the books, whatever it is, and you do it for yourself. And then you go back to your doctor and you say, look how much healthier I am. And if they give you some answer like, oh, well, that's going to kill you. That's bad for your heart. Uh, you know, again, time to find a do another doctor. If they are curious as to how you improved your health so dramatically with some of the dramatic improvements that I see with my patients every day, getting off of multiple medications, losing weight, improving their numbers, and measurably improving their health. And if they go back to their doctor and their doctor says, stop doing that because of whatever reason, you know what? It's time to find another doctor. Uh, and the good news is, is that there are lots of doctors out there. There are an increasing number of doctors who are coming around to this way of thinking. I go to the meetings uh, I talk with them um, in, you know, groups with them. Uh, we're working on ways to make this more accessible to people. Uh, but for right now, the answer is you put the effort in, you find a doctor or another practitioner that is going to support you in your journey. As you tell your story here, it brings up for me this really unique position you're in as a heart surgeon who was trained conventionally had this epiphany and this transformation within their health and has learned so much and, and this new knowledge on diet and lifestyle opposes so much of what you would have learned as a medical doctor. And what this brings up for me is I got a taste of this reading your book, this, this resentment and anger that I feel like there's some of that in the background because of what you learn and how different that is from your education 
talk about that and how you've had to, or if you're working on letting that go and, and just moving on and realizing, you know, that was then this is now. Yeah. You know, it, it is, um, uh, you know, I don't know that I would term it as anger, uh, but you know, it's, uh, and I'm not quite sure what the term is, you know, it's anger on behalf of my patients, I guess is what I would say. Uh, because I realize, you know, that I did harm patients with my advice in the past. I didn't know better, you know, it wasn't intentional, but patients were harmed by the advice that I gave them in the past. And that's something I need to accept. You know, I can't change it. All I can do is move forward and make sure that I'm not going to be doing that, you know, continue uh, to do that. And so it is empowering to me. I... um would say that, you know, I am much more enthusiastic about my future than I have ever been. Uh, and, you know, this is in a face of a healthcare system that the rates of burnout, you know, among practitioners is just through the roof. More and more physicians are just giving up and leaving medicine because they've become so frustrated with all of the various aspects about it. Uh, and me, I am looking for new ways, better ways. What else can I be doing uh, to, you know, get the message to people? Just today, I mean, you know, just this morning uh, before we started reporting this podcast, I was giving a grand rounds lecture to the health system that I'm currently working at, talking about, you know, metabolic health. Uh, and so um, I am trying to find ways to educate my fellow uh, practitioners about this and um, trying to help them uh, open their eyes to what I have found. Uh, and, you know, again, I recognize the reason that they're not doing it is usually because they have never heard this information. Some of them have heard it and have just choose to ignore it and they can't get past, you know, they can't change their thinking. Uh, unfortunately, I can't help those doctors much. They have to be willing to make the change, just like patients have to be willing to make the change. But the ones that are open to this, I want to be there to get that information to as many of them as possible. And that's why I'm working on some of the other things that I work on to make this more accessible to people and to get this information out there to support the practitioners that want to do this. Do you find that knowing what you know and trying to apply that to your practice and as a doctor in the hospital, do you find standard of care has you handcuffed in certain ways where you can't educate the patients and perform in a way that you know is best given the current standard of care? Yeah, honestly, there are some challenges uh, you know, the most notable is the food that gets served in, in the hospital. Uh, and, you know, it, it really does bother me every day when I'm making rounds, uh, you know, on the patients that I just performed heart surgery on, knowing that it's due to insulin resistance uh, and seeing the heavily processed carbohydrate heavy food that they get served. Uh, you know, and again, it, it's something that I'm trying to work around. Uh, you know, I, I've been, I, I tried to get, you know, other dietary options introduced to the hospital. I just try and empower the patient to say, okay, well, I'm going to, from this, I'm going to pick out what I can, or, or maybe my family can bring me in food or something like that. Um, you know, also understanding that in my role as a heart surgeon, which is what takes me into the hospital, uh, you know, the patient that comes to me for heart surgery may not be thinking about this stuff yet. It's an opportunity for me to start to educate them. And we do now, we have that discussion. You know, I have this discussion with all the patients I operate on now. And I tell them, the operation that I'm going to do is not going to address why you got here in the first place. It doesn't address the underlying process that led to you developing heart disease. And if you want to do that, you need to make changes so that you don't end up back on my operating table. You know, I call it, the, the book is titled Stay Off My Operating Table. And, you know, I give it to them after surgery. And I say, you know, 
you weren't able to stay off my operating table, but you don't want to end up back on my operating table, uh, you know, so to speak. So now you need to address the underlying issues that led to you getting heart disease in the first place. And quite frankly, I think that makes me a much more effective doctor. When I'm picturing you giving this this rounds this morning, what brought that up for me is the fact that, say these doctors buy into what you're saying and they want to you know, suggest a lower carb diet, a carnivore diet, given there's the food pyramid or whatever it is these days. And then there's a standard of care, say for certain medications, if cholesterol gets to a certain level, like, is there ever challenges having to apply the current standard of care, knowing that there are better options, but they're not currently yeah. the way conventional medicine sees things? Yeah, exactly. And and yes, that is a challenge. And again, thankfully, we're getting more and more resources that can support doctors uh, that want to uh, want to take on that challenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, working with organizations like the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners uh, that has released clinical guidelines uh, on implementing low carbohydrate diets. Um, there is a uh, uh, I don't think it's come out quite yet, but it's coming out quite soon, a textbook on therapeutic carbohydrate restriction uh, coming out from uh, Tim Noakes and the Nutrition Network. So we're going to have resources that we need. Uh, and the standard of care, uh, you know, the, the, the standard that doctors are held to is that they are operating in the best interest of their patient. Uh, and again, that's something that doctors need to really start asking themselves. Uh, is, you know, are some of these things that we're doing truly in the best interest of our patient? Um, and if the answer is yes, uh, I, you know, I am confident that I can defend the actions that I'm taking. And if it ever comes to a point where, you know, I'm facing a challenge to my medical license, like some practitioners have faced, or, you know, uh, I'm facing a, a disciplinary action of some sort, I am confident that I have been doing what's in the best interest of my patients and what's supported by the evidence that's around me. So that's all that I can do. I, I you know, I, I am trying to have the influence within the system to change the environment as best I can. That's a whole, you know, that's a bigger challenge, a bigger project uh, that I'm willing to undertake. Uh, and again, I, I fully understand that I have now constructed my life in a way to give me more control over my professional life. And some doctors just aren't able to do that. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't hold that against them. I just hope that I can serve as an example to other physicians that ultimately want to make similar changes. Phil, I know we got to part ways here in a sec, but we'll end on this. Throughout our conversation, we've gotten little bits and pieces of what you eat and how you eat. I think you mentioned eating one or two times a day and and you mentioned grilling a steak. So we've gotten these little bits and pieces, but take me through what a typical day looks like. When are you eating and what are you eating? And I think this is really helpful for people that have been eating a standard type diet because they're picturing carnivore or carnivore-ish. And in the beginning, at least, that's really hard to picture what, where you'd get all those calories and still get some diversity. So I'll have you talk about that. Sure thing. Happy to uh, take you through that, you know, and, uh, it's about two o'clock here, uh, where, where I am as we're recording. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, I woke up at my usual time, which is about five thirty, six o'clock, um, got my day started, uh, just had some coffee, black coffee, uh, and, uh, just before we started recording, I uh, ate probably a cup of uh, yogurt. Uh, it was a whole milk, you know, yogurt, uh, non-flavored, you know, plain whole milk yogurt. Um, I have a, um, yesterday I prepared about a three pound uh, tri-tip uh, roast. Uh, I ate half of it yesterday. I got the other half waiting for me and I'll probably, you know, I'll have that when we wrap up eating. Uh, today's a travel day for me, so I'll, I'll be on a flight tonight. And uh, most likely, you know, that may be all I eat today. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'll probably, you know, at the airport, I usually limit myself to another cup of coffee. Uh, and that's about it. 
Uh, but, you know, I will have eaten, uh, like I said, a good pound and a half of tri-tip, uh, and that's going to keep me full for likely 24 hours. You know, I might eat, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow's a weekend. So, you know, and uh, uh, I might be having, uh, the, that's when I maybe eat breakfast. Most days I don't eat breakfast. You know, I have lunch typically kind of in the mid afternoon because I'm operating, you know, most mornings. Uh, and I get out of the operating room, you know, by the time I kind of can sit down and have a chance to eat, it's typically two, three o'clock and I'll have, you know, maybe, you know, what I'm going to say is a typical day for me. You know, I'll take a pound of ground beef. I'll mix in a couple of eggs. Uh, you know, I'll cook that up. I'll eat that, uh, for my sort of, I guess you call it lunch, mid afternoon meal. And then, you know, maybe three or four hours later, 6, 7 p.m., uh, I might have, you know, a steak uh, or, um, you know, uh, something, else, a piece of fish. You know, I eat, uh, I eat a fair amount of seafood. Uh, I have some dairy, as I said. And that's usually it. And it's pretty simple. Um, I don't feel bored. You know, people say, don't you get bored of eating the same things? I get enough variety. You know, I eat different cuts of meat. I eat different types of meat. I eat beef. I eat lamb. Uh, you know, I eat, uh, you know, some other game meats when I can find them. I eat seafood. Uh, I eat eggs. I eat dairy. That really provides enough variety uh, that uh, it's not an issue. And like I said, it's simple and it sustains me. So uh, that's what keeps me functioning best. You mentioned having a coffee at the airport later. Will you bring any jerky or any dried snacks in case you get hungry on the plane? No, usually not, because like I said, I know at this point, you know, if I have a, a pound and a half of, you know, tri-tip steak, I know that's going to keep me full, you know, uh, at least until tomorrow. So I don't, I, I don't really worry about it much. Um, if I needed to, like if I was in a pinch, uh, you know, I'll, stop it wherever at the, at the, uh, airport and I'll get two or three burger patties, you know, without anything on them. And, uh, you know, I, I can do that if I need to, the vast majority of the time I don't need to, because, uh, you know, uh, I can go. And, and like I said, at this point, my body is well enough adapted, uh, that if I get into situations where I can't eat for 24 hours, it's not a problem. Uh, you know, that's one of the, uh, empowering things about being able to fast is that, you know, if I have to go 24 or even longer without eating, I can do that as well. Phil, you've been really generous with your time. I really enjoyed the conversation. We're going to link up your book, your social media, your website, everything in the show notes. Great. And you're just you're doing such a great thing in the world being such a trailblazer and and sharing this message and and I thank you for everything. Yeah, and thank you Jesse for, you know, doing what you do and having this platform to be able to get this message out to people. Thank you, Phil. Now that you're done my conversation with Phil, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Anthony. He's got a lot more to share when it comes to eating a carnivore diet. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. No animal eats the, the variety of plants that we do, and I think that that's causing and driving.